Okay, so we are now live streaming now that we have a, a full quorum and we have our guests and we have our audience. I'd like to welcome our speakers today. I'm Keith Bradshaw with the New York Times. We're going to start with Professor uh, Wang Dong from uh, Peking University. Then we're going to go to George Lee, a uh, pharmaceuticals and medical device company entrepreneur. Then to Rosemary Tan, a uh, Malaysian entrepreneur. Then to Ben, ben Gotzel, an expert on artificial intelligence. And we're going to come back to Roger King, who is an expert on uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, our subject today is how will age Asia do after the pandemic? What does 2021 hold for after what has been in every respect a very difficult 2020? Uh, we're particularly interested in what our guests think will be the implications of RCEP, the Re Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership into which China and 14 other countries entered two weeks ago, which will reduce tariffs across across all of East Asia, all the way down to New Zealand. Uh, with that, why don't I ask uh, Professor Wong to start us off and uh, tell us a little bit about what he sees as the, the landscape in Asia as the world begins to recover, begins to develop uh, reliable uh, vaccines and so forth as we move into 2021. Professor Wong, please. Uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, meet you uh, all through so this uh, very special uh, virtual format. Um, well, first of all, I think the COVID-19 pandemic currently has uh, brought the world to the verge of economic, global economic recessions. And many people, uh, frankly, are getting increasingly pessimistic about the prospect of, uh, uh, of globalization um, and believe that the globalization is over uh, or we are entering into so-called deglobalization era. However, I would like to argue that globalization is not over, uh, nor are we now in a deglobalization era. Rather, uh, we are entering into what I call the reglobalization era. Um, and also, uh, you know, please, uh, if kids allow, uh, I would like to uh, a little bit of self-promotion here. I actually got a book, a new book will just come out by the end of this year. Uh, Number 13 by Rutledge. It is called Reglobalization When China Meets the World Again. So I will provide a uh, more uh, in depth analysis over there. Um, I'd like to very quickly share, I think, two pieces of evidence uh, in support of my argument. First, uh, Keith already mentioned that, which is a signing of this uh, historic uh, agreement, uh, the, the RCEP uh, agreement. I think this is very, very significant uh, because it now, uh, has already become the largest uh, uh, the trading uh, free trade agreement ever uh, the, the we I think the the world has ever witnessed uh, and covering a market of uh, 2.2 billion people uh, and 26.2 uh, trillion of global output uh, that also accounts for about 30 uh, percent of the uh, the world uh, population as well as uh, one third of the global economy. Uh, so we are talking about the largest uh, ever uh, free trade agreement, uh, even larger than uh, the European Union or U.S.-Mexico-Canada uh, agreement. Uh, and of course, many people actually quickly pointed to the fact that, well, you know, ASEP is not uh, the, a lot of the, the conditions or the kind of free trade um, uh, criteria uh, are not that high uh, as compared to maybe like CPTPP. That is certainly true. However, I think it still shows that uh, that the world, despite uh, these uh, the repercussions brought by uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, the world still uh, very much I think moving uh, toward uh, more closely integrated, uh, 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 like in terms of uh, free trade and f free flow of uh, uh, of uh, goods of uh, yeah, etc. So, so I think this is very important. Um, very important, I think, uh, 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 progress uh, in moving toward a reorganization. And second, uh, secondly, very quickly, I uh, some people might have uh, uh, already noted, which is IMF uh, has published a number of uh, predictions, the outlook, global economic outlook this year, and most recently in October. The prediction of there is that it is as estimated that the global GDP growth. Uh, this year will be uh, no surprising negative 4.4%. Uh, However, it is estimated that uh, next year, the global economic uh, 
gross GDP gross will rebound to 5.2 uh, percent, and for China this year will be 1.9 percent. Uh, China will be uh, one of the few uh, uh, economies still growing this year. Uh, however, next year uh, it is as means that China's economy economic growth will bounce to about to 8.2 percent, and the ASEAN. Uh, will be six two point two percent. So, so this all put together, of course, uh, they they are also making very important a number a set of uh, very important assumptions, including uh, the success in vaccine and manufacturing, etc. Uh, but I think this this still shows uh, the IMF is making a very important uh, assessment, uh, which is uh, COVID pandemic doesn't change. Uh, the way it doesn't change uh, the economic law, so to speak, uh, that really uh, pushing globalization uh, together. It's just because of this uh, pandemic. And I hope it's uh, it's it putting uh, the economic activity and social activities. Uh, but uh, with the progresses uh, we are currently making, uh, many countries are working very hard in that regard uh, in uh, uh, producing uh, vaccine, etc. I think we are. Uh, sort of uh, seeing the light at the other end of the tunnel, so to speak. So I probably will stop here. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for that optimistic uh, outlook. Why don't I switch next to George for somebody who has particularly looked at the medical issues and at some of the new kinds of inventions and products that have been created uh, that might be another reason for hope coming up into 2021. Uh, George, would you please tell us about them? Okay, uh, thank you very much. So it's a great pleasure to be here. So uh, my background basically uh, is a venture capitalist and also, you know, um, you know um, facilitator, you know, to support innovative technology, uh, you know, to uh, uh, to address the med- medical needs. So for COVID-19 uh, changes things a lot. And uh, at the beginning of the breakout of the COVID-19, and, uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, organized uh, uh, technology and the solutions, you know, uh, to help doctors, you know, to, to provide the protections and also detection solutions for them. So uh, we see um, the industry work very efficiently and closely and uh, to move things very fast. You know, um, you know, uh, our uh, fund, you know, we have invested a company which can provide the CRISPR and the point of care uh, fast, uh, you know, uh, detecting solution for COVID-19. So um, the company, you know, uh, very quickly, you know, responds to the, uh, they have the technology platform, but, you know, uh, within uh, around uh, 20 days, the company developed the, the prototype and, uh, you know, put it into the field place. And uh, you know, got very good you know testing result. So uh, this is a uh, really uh, efficient process uh, I see uh, I ever see before. And also you know, um, during the COVID nineteen, you know, we are looking for the uh, next generation high sensitive uh, detection solution because that will uh, I think COVID nineteen will uh, raise the industry concerns. You know, how how can we do the uh, the, the on spot? you know, a uh, rapid test, you know, for this kind of, you know, uh, infection disease. So the industry looking for the new technology. So uh, during the COVID-19, you know, uh, we finished the due diligence on the uh, point of care digital PCR solution, the technology originated from Harvard. And, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, during the COVID-19, you know, uh, we finished the due diligence. We overcome the, the hurdles, you know, the site visit and uh, you know we, we conducted the online and we have our consultant you know uh, helped us to do the, the site testing so uh, within uh, two months uh, we finished the, the, the process and uh, you know um, luckily you know uh, we have this company you know uh, also developed the prototype you know which can provide a very high sensitive you know uh, infection disease solution is the next generation PCR technology. So, you know, they'll be a prototype. So uh, COVID-19, I think, you know, uh, first of all, uh, I, I think we are raising the industry concerns, you know, how we uh, make technology, you know, fast response to this kind of crisis. And uh, we see some good examples. And uh, uh, I think that will uh, also uh, raise the regulatory and also government concerns. Uh, we see 
uh, for the uh, emergency you know needs you know the government regulatory you know can really give them fast approval track so and also um i think uh in china you know also can provide uh for this covid-19 uh pandemic you know china provide very good you know testing uh place for this kind of you know a new technology and uh, you know also can uh you know provide a uh, very efficient uh you know uh support you know to help those kind of technology you know commercialize and uh, uh i think you know, um from our perspective we see um there's more technology looking for the opportunity to collaborate globally and uh, china can provide very good you know a place for them to do the clinical trial and also you know uh, have very good you know uh, efficient uh, infra- infrastructure to support uh, those kind of technology and to help them to commercialize and also you know we are now working with those two companies you know to helping them to enter the global market and we really wanted to push this kind of new technology to benefit not just you know patients from china but also you know uh global population so we 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 will see uh, this kind of you know um new model you know uh industry capital and uh, technology you know work closely and uh you know to fight for the uh next crisis and uh, so uh also we see a lot of you know technologies uh, you know looking for the uh opportunity in china yeah so so I'm quite positive you know regarding the collaboration okay thank you for that optimistic as well note as well uh, george and with that i'll go to rosemary i know that uh, rosemary you've looked uh, in particular detail at both uh, sustainable agriculture and construction Where do you see both of those categories going in 2021? How have those been affected by COVID and uh, do you see a short-term improvement in either sector in Malaysia? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being included in this panel. Um it's a big question so from a micro level um let me let me look at the big picture macro level and then I go to micro. So with this our 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 CEP it's very encouraging it's it's for us entrepreneurs it's like a tap being open uh where our markets are enlarged and and uh we can do more things together you know with the proverb where you, oh, one of the old proverbs that we I learned was when you want to go go far as you go alone but when when you want to go far you go together so I'm also with a organization called entrepreneurs organization and we go together we hold one another and and we actually support each other through this thing so with our cep i see that as a bigger platform for us to collaborate and even more uh, sustainable things and and things for the overall good so on a micro level because of this um, industry that i'm in so construction first because it's an inward looking thing so it is for the local market and what is involved in terms of how um uh, trade will will affect us is whether we get our materials um so it has affected us in the sense that this is the ships not well ships are moving but you know a lot of curtailment in terms of um um how many ships are out there what what is actually reaching us and and is stuck at the port so in reality things are stuck at the port um uh, and even if we could um factories are open in factories are open when covid happened like a lot of factories were, were even not not allowed to do unless you are essential so that has affected us even on a local basis uh so getting materials will be hard um so it's not the opening of trade but what is covid affecting us and it's 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 like construction site got closed down because a thousand of them were positive uh so that is major so major on the construction on the agriculture side it opens the door open wide so i could learn uh from my neighbors learn from other members that are are doing agriculture uh there's aid as help um uh, and in terms of s- sustainability what i've learned from the covid situation is like food security so if our borders are not open nobody is growing things how do we get our food um so on the micro level that's what we are looking at as what we are concerned with and we would love to have more help from all over the world and our region to help one another through this kind of situation so in that sense i'm very hopeful um and and i would like to appeal to the policy makers as a micro is to open the tap please allow us to do more trade 
please allow us to 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 create jobs and uh, yeah please allow us to um, help one another so instead of curtailing us with more policies in the internal so i will speak from a malaysian point of view uh where i, I was just on another uh, room where they were talking about sustainability and in agriculture we have to go through so many middlemen in order to get to our market so if that can be even cut down even further then every farmer will have a potential um a more potential to to have a more pay more income so that they are no longer the bottom of the pyramid one dollar a day to more um and that will be helpful for all mankind because now uh it is more difficult to do things alone than in a micro order in a silo so we need everybody thank you uh thank you rosemary for that uh, clear description on construction and on sustainable agriculture in Malaysia. And I'm going to want to come back to you on the difficulties about products being stuck at the port. I hadn't realized that was uh, really uh, slowing down construction. But first, let me go to uh, Ben uh, and get more of the, uh, if you can unmute, please, Ben, uh, more on the uh, perspective of how AI can be useful in the short term here. Uh, as opposed to sort of uh, years ahead. Where is AI going to make a concrete difference in tackling COVID in the coming months and in helping the world rebound in 2021? Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, artificial intelligence, as everyone knows, is in a phase of really rapid growth where it's affecting affecting every vertical market. And I mean, the the bulk of the work being done to address COVID medically has, hasn't involved AI, right? It's been messenger RNA based, based vaccines. I am involved with a, a group in the U S that's using machine learning to help determine the optimal cocktail of antivirals for a given COVID patient based on their their genomics and based on clinical medical indicators. So there, there is a use of machine learning to optimize medical care for COVID patients. Um, it's not, it's not that widespread at, at, at the moment and we may diminish, you know, COVID through vaccination before the use of machine learning to optimize, you know, treatment becomes as widespread as it, as it should be. So, I mean, I think if, if anything there, what we see is, yes, machine learning can help save lives, but the medical industry is not that well geared up to, to, to utilize it. So it's not being rolled out as, as well as it could be. And we're seeing that in a more severe way, I think, in the domain of modeling of COVID spread and evaluation of COVID policies. So, I mean, together with my team at Singularity Net, our, our decentralized blockchain-based AI network, we've been doing simulations of agent-based modeling, a sort of AI social modeling applied to COVID-19 spread. And, you know, you can, you can build agent-based models of particular regions and do in-depth simulation of different, you know, restaurants, schools, stores, different types of people, children, retirees, and so forth. And, I mean, you can... You can use this to try to objectively evaluate in a simulation, you know, whether a certain policy, like say shutting down elementary school or opening restaurants at 25% capacity is actually going to have the impact that, that you want. But it's striking how infrequently this approach is, is taken. Right? This is less, however, of an issue in Asia at this point, because through you know, tracking and testing and lockdowns and so on, Asian countries, many have been really, really effective at, at, at damping down COVID-19. But in the in the West, I, I would say COVID has been let to spread to a great degree and AI modeling has not been used as, as much as it, as it should have been. On, on the other hand, I think the second half of what you asked, you know, how AI will be impacting the nature of the, recovery from COVID, I think the story is, is, is quite different. So I'd say the potential of AI to help combat COVID has mostly not been exploited in the way that, that it really could be. And there's still maybe, there's still maybe time. I mean, the disease is not, is not, is not defeated yet. Right. But, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that 
agent-based modeling and machine learning will be more thoroughly used. On, on, on the other hand, you know, I think one of the things we're going to see well, as the economy starts to come out of COVID is that many areas of industry are not being as lame about utilizing AI as the, you know, the medicine and COVID policy m- m- modeling uh, branches of, of, of government. And what, what we're going to see is that in one industry sector af- after another, you know, not all the jobs are, are going to come back. And in a lot of cases, what's going to happen is, you know, COVID-19 created what I think of as, as a bear market for humans, right? I mean, COVID-19 created a, a situation where it's, in many cases, just very cumbersome to employ human beings to, to do stuff. And so many businesses have found ways, either through AI or simpler forms of, of automation, many businesses have come ways to rely less on humans to do what they, what they needed to do. And I, I think in many cases you're going to see, you know, not all those humans need to need to come back even after COVID is is defeated. And this, you know, this will occur in simple ways and in less obvious ways. Say, you know, I myself, I didn't often order groceries for delivery at my house before COVID. Not now, I, I commonly do. And you know, after COVID is gone, I'll go to the store more than I do now. But I'm, I've got in the habit of ordering groceries for delivery at home. It's kind of convenient, right? And so, I mean, in the end, you will need fewer people in, 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 in the grocery store. And, you know, I, I know some fast food chains have, they've automated the, the drive through now so that when you, when you drive your car through a little booth to order your burger, you're talking to an AI instead of a person. I mean, that's been accelerating because of COVID, but what you don't need, you don't need to, to roll back, right? And I think in at the other end of the spectrum, also you look in and say venture capital traditionally has been reliant on you know endless meetings, going to conferences and schmooze with with potential uh, companies you might want to invest in, do a lot of face to face meetings. But now, you know that VCs are sitting at home assessing deals. You're relying more and more on various online search tools and also automated methods for, for evaluating various companies. And you, you're seeing automated analytics go further and further toward early stage investment rather than just, just public markets. And again, of course, VCs will go to conferences and, and, and schmooze again, you know, face-to-face pitches will happen again, but reliance on automated analytics, you know, that's, that's, that's not gonna, that's not gonna go away. So I, I, th- I think we're going to see, shift toward automation being accelerated by what's what's happened with covid and i think i think this will be a will be a global phenomenon but of of, of course the you know us china tensions and the complex geopolitics will impact all this but in subtle ways because in in ai what you see is you know, open sharing of algorithms, open sharing of research papers and open source software code, but siloing of data, both within big tech companies and within within countries, right? Not wanting to share share data with, with other countries, which isn't isn't just China. I mean, India doesn't want to share data about Indian people outside of India either. And, you know, why would they? The U.S. wouldn't want all the data about U.S. people to be monopolized by large Indian or Chinese companies, right? So, I mean, I think that as we go into an AI-dominated economy, even after COVID is is gone, this dual dynamic of sort of open sharing of the science and algorithms and, you know, very avid siloing of of data that feeds AI algorithms to make judgments about people in different countries. It should lead to a quite interesting dynamic with some subtle tensions there, which are going to be both problematic and, and creative. Thank you. And that is a, uh, in some ways, deeply pessimistic outlook for uh, persistent long-term unemployment. But uh, it's certainly an interesting well, I look at that as optimistic because I think there's better things for people to do than than, uh, than work for a living. But, yeah, I think, uh, I think we're going to see universal basic income as a necessity. And I don't think it's going to be a big problem in the West or in most of Asia. I think it's going to be a big, pro- big problem in Africa, for example, and in, in places where there's just not 
the the wealth to support universal basic income. So then that, I mean, that would lead into a whole other category of issues. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Ben. I'm going to want to come back to you on that. But first, let me give uh, Roger a chance to wrap up our first round here. And uh, by the way, as people uh, are watching, I want to encourage you to use the uh, 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 comments mode. I already see one comment from one of our viewers who says, uh, fewer people in stores, but many more to deliver. Uh, and that is, uh, that is accurate. Uh, so if you have questions for our guests among our uh, viewers, then please uh, submit them in the comments panel, which is live right now. And with that, I'd like to go to, uh, to Roger, uh, hearing what the other four panelists have said, and then also maybe adding your own perspective as somebody who talks to a lot of leading family entrepreneurs uh, and uh, coming from a family of leading fam family entrepreneurs. Uh, what is your perspective uh, going into uh, 2021, uh, particularly for Asia and particularly for a uh, for an RCEP and post-COVID Asia. Roger, please go ahead. Well, th thank you, uh, Keith. Um, you, you know, uh, I've been involved with family business research and family office research and teaching for the last 15 years. Uh, I started my life off uh, actually uh, working for, uh, as a computer researcher, uh, working for Bell Labs in the uh, military research lab in New, New Jersey. And I Nowadays, I joke around with people. I said, you know, uh, I don't think uh, I'll be hired today in New Jersey in a military research lab as an ethnic Chinese because uh, I'll be uh, thought of as a, a spy uh, working in the in, uh, United States itself. I'm now based in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm less optimistic about uh, things in general. Uh, by the way, in terms of family, family businesses, you know, globally, uh, 60 plus percent of the businesses are controlled by families. Okay, and uh, but you know the one of, one of the interesting challenges uh, business life cycle is getting shorter and shorter these days, and human life cycle is getting longer and longer. So what happens is in a single human life cycle, there are probably several different business cycle. So uh, what I see is that a lot of families are willing now to sell their businesses, especially. Uh, uh, future generations. They look at their uh, family, traditional business and so forth, um, and uh, they're w willing to exit. Uh, I uh, mentioned earlier, before we came on, our family uh, was involved in container shipping and uh, a company called OCL. And uh, when, when uh, ultimately we had a very, very good offer, we, uh, above, uh, we were a listed company above market capitalization and we decided to exit uh, from that business, a business that was founded by my father-in-law uh, in 1947. So it, it, there was a lot of emotion attached to it. I'm a little bit uh, less optimistic than most of the people. I think the trade war is only the tip of the so-called uh, uh, confrontation between the United States and, and uh, China itself. As a U.S. citizen born in the United States, uh, as an ethnic Chinese, I'm torn between the two sides. And, uh, you, you know, this decoupling concept itself and, uh, you, you know, we're moving away from globalization. I think the only way the world is going to have some peace is really let's do things together. You, you know, each of us can uh, contribute to the society in a very, very different way. And this is what we really need to do. You know, if you look at North America, uh, Europe uh, combined, you know, they, they constitute a, uh, maybe, uh, uh, what, 15 percent of the total population. But look at Asia. Look at, uh, you know, India uh, and, and uh, China itself. You know, the idea of having America to be the policeman of the globe, uh, you, you know, I think the, those days uh, come to an end. OK, and we should, you know, instead of competing, why not collaborate? Uh, you know, this, this is a very, 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 very important. Like Ben mentioned, you know, AI, information is all over the place. You know, so, you know, just try to, uh, you know, put yourself uh, in a position that uh, uh, where you don't share information, that's not going to be very, very good. I mean, you look at uh, what the United States did uh, with Huawei with the 5G, uh, you, you know, they say, well, it uh, uh, has uh, implications on military security issues and so forth and so on. Well, 
is that really true? Or is it, you know, and so they stopped a lot of things. And, you know, Huawei today, I think, is what I call the Sputnik moment for China. China now is saying, look, because of this, we can no longer rely upon other countries. We have to develop everything on our own now. And that's not a good thing either. But, you know, they are left with no choice. And look what's happening now. China is actually moving into the 6G. Uh, you, you know, people are still talking about 5G, and China is already moving to 6G. So what we really need to do, whether it's uh, the RCEP uh, concept itself, you, you know, we really need to, on a global basis, have a means to recognize each country has its own uh, contribution to the society and how we can collaborate and work together. And uh, this is the only way we're going to have proper peace. And if we don't do that, you, you know, Donald Trump's created a, a mess. And I'm not sure uh, he, you know, uh, Joe Biden's going to improve the situation at all. I think, uh, he, you know, I have two grandchildren uh, that are studying in a university in the uh, United States. Uh, uh, because of COVID, they're, they're studying uh, online at the moment. But, you know, uh, there's so much China bashing physically in, in you know, a lot of uh, Chinese students now are not willing to go to the United States to study. They prefer to move into other uh, territories. That is not a good sign. You know, we ought to open up the world to everyone. And China is opening up. A lot of uh, uh, foreign students are moving into China. Uh, you know, Keith, you're based uh, currently in Beijing. You know, we really need to open up the world. So I'm less optimistic unless we can all, you know, think that it's for the benefit of the entire humanity. That's the important thing. Thank you. Professor Wong, thank you, Roger. And uh, Professor Wong, perhaps if I can go back to you again, because you were definitely striking a much more optimistic note than Roger about the potential for further globalization. But uh, in addition to, for example, uh, China's push for to build a lot of new semiconductor industry factories, partly prompted by the Huawei issue, uh, we also saw the uh, important long-term policy statement by uh, the top leader uh, here in China in Seeking Truth magazine calling for uh, increasing technological innovation and import substitution. And that uh, that was about, I guess it was, it was a speech in April, but it was published at the end of October. <laughs> So uh, here in Beijing, I, I hear some people talking import substitution. I hear other people talking about uh, uh, still following the reform and opening up. Uh, are those two goals consistent and achievable at the same time? Okay. Um, I'll be very uh, brief here, Keith. I think this is a great question. I think indeed uh, many questions. Many people here also are debating about this uh, uh, issue as well. Uh, I think my answer to this question is uh, is clear cut. I think, uh, uh, of course, uh, they are consistent because uh, what I think we've learned uh, from the uh, uh, the uh, Trump administration's uh, very disruptive, you know, policy. Uh, one of the experiences we've learned, lessons we've learned, is that uh, there's a potential sort of risks involved. Uh, in the supply chain, um, and it is not because, uh, partly because, you know, if one uh, country wants to, uh, what we call it, uh, over uh, securitization uh, of um, uh, of the supply chain, and then uh, there is risk involved. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, if you're making policy, uh, then industry policy, then you want it to, to address that as well. Uh, on the other hand, I think the China, the message from China, uh, from top leader uh, to you know, I'm sure you visit a lot of uh, companies and enterprises here in China as well. Uh, I think uh, it's very clear, uh, which is uh, which is China uh, will pursue uh, even higher level of opening up uh, and a deep, even deeper level of reforms. And just look at just you know the other day, uh, you know, last week, uh, President Xi. Uh, in his uh, most recent speech, uh, and also said very clearly that China uh, it will be proactively considering joining CPTPP, and uh, this is no small deal. I think this is a big deal, um, and uh, and uh, uh, and this also shows I think China's commitment to uh, uh, joining hands with 
other members uh, of the international community, uh, community and pushing for economic globalization. And, and certainly I think we have to uh, work together. I think, uh, you know, I, I do believe I'm not the only one uh, optimist uh, in this room. Uh, so we have to work together uh, to, uh, to fight uh, the pandemic and also fight off a uh, shared better future. Okay, we're gonna need to move quickly because we only have five minutes left. We had such interesting initial presentations, but why don't I, I wanna quickly catch you next, Rosemary. What are, I had not heard of serious port problems delaying construction. Is that getting goods from, from China? Uh, is there, uh, I had thought that a lot of the, uh, uh, the district of the sort of global supply chain issues had been resolved by now. What, 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 can you give any examples? I mean, is it steel beams? Is it nails? What is the, uh, <laughs> no, it's usually finishing product, whether it's from Thailand, uh, from our region, actually. Uh, so we get a lot of finishing products from Thailand. We have, uh, tiles from China. And initially it was, when COVID happened and nobody knew exactly what to do, so like uh, who can work, who cannot work, and and so the port was um, uh, how do you say limited in terms of uh, amount of offices that were there, so customs were were you know slowed down in the sense that how many people can actually work. So those were the things that got stuck in the beginning. So now that things are open, what we see on the on the entrepreneurial level is like. Logistic is a huge thing, you know, with uh, Ben was saying about buying things online, somebody has to deliver them. So logistic has opened up for the business, I um, mean, in terms of uh, delivering goods to people since we can't go out, right, or go to the stores ourselves uh, uh, or that, that, that kind of limitation. So it works as well for the industries. So can we get our raw ingredients? So, for example, my neighbor is a chicken farm in the agriculture. Uh, it, it's a chicken farm. And when everything was locked down, the, the hotels were not open, the restaurants were not open, tourism was not coming in. So their normal market of buying chicken was curtailed by a lot. So, but chickens, you cannot stop production, they grow. So, so that is an example on, on the micro level, how it affects uh, businesses uh, in, in Malaysia. So it is, it is important. So working, I, I agree with, uh, with, um, with Dr. King, um, Roger, right, to say that we need to work together. We need to help one another because uh, we need each other to survive. Collaboration. Very quickly. Yes, exactly. Very quickly, George, in, in 30 seconds, what is the biggest lingering technical obstacle to producing the kind of products you're making as a result of COVID? Are there still delays in finding people or supply chain delays, or do you are not really encountering any problems in actually making things now because of COVID? Yeah, I think the COVID uh, provide a very good opportunity uh, for this kind of new technology. And in China now, you know, everything uh, almost come back to normal. So, you know, people still wear masks, but, you know, economy point of view, you know, uh, everything back to normal. So, you know, we have the, uh, you know, the facility, you know, uh, in full speed, you know, to produce the prototype. And in terms of regulatory, it's faster than ever before. And now, you know, we are looking for the global opportunity, you know, to ship this kind of device, you know, to European market and uh, get the CE mark and hopefully later on the FDA. So I think that's how things, you know, can really come back very fast and, uh, you know, uh, people work closely and collaborate with each other. You know, we can overcome the, the crisis. Ben, very briefly, am I too gloomy in assessing you as predicting long-term structural unemployment for people who do not have uh, the technical skills or other skills that allow them to work from home? I think it, it's going to be a quite complex pattern via which different job categories are removed by by automation and no one's going to be able to predict in, in detail which things AI is going to be able to take over which year versus versus the next year right but uh, the overall trend will be one more automation less less human and and indeed the only people who will be close to secure will be the ones who really are highly adaptive and, and highly operating at a more strategic level, which will probably be the last last sort of thing that AIs will be able to to take over. And I think Asia, however, is going to be at the forefront of creating the automation 
technologies, in, including a- AI and, and robotics and, and, and so forth. So, I mean, I mean, I think the Asian region and China are gonna are gonna do very well as, as a whole. But then the issue of how individuals in different socioeconomic strata do within each country is a perhaps more problematic thing. Okay. Thank you all. We are uh, we are actually just out of time, but we haven't had a chance to see, hear a couple of times from each of our speakers. I really appreciate your joining us for this event. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye.